Welcome to The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Listen to Joe tackle the really tough moral issues, current events, and politics from a Catholic perspective. Now here's Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Hello again, Sixpack family. Welcome back to The Cantankerous Catholic, episode 122. The United States of America has changed in the past six months more than at any other time in our 250-year history. We're witnessing the erosion of our freedoms to the point that we're moving from freedom to chains, and it's our own damn fault. We did more than let it happen. We actually asked for it. As you know, I don't like asking for your financial support. I always want a win-win situation whenever possible. Well, I've got a way for you to help this apostolate without you having to do anything you're not already doing. Everybody shops on Amazon. I've developed an affiliate relationship with Amazon. When you visit cantankerouscatholic.com and click on the episodes page, blog page, or about the show page, on the right-hand side of the page you'll see Amazon ads for Catholic books and merchandise. There's no price difference from Amazon's site, but if you click on something you're interested in and buy it, Amazon will pay me a small commission just for you clicking on that ad. It doesn't stop there either. Anytime you're on Amazon and find things you want to buy, send me the link to the items and I'll send you another link to click when you're ready to buy. You won't pay a dime more for the item, but Amazon will pay me a commission. That way, you can help to financially support this apostolate just by doing what you were going to do anyway. Remember, visit the episodes, blog, and about the show pages to find Catholic books and merchandise, and send me links to other things you want to buy on Amazon, and I'll send you the links that will pay this apostolate a small commission. And I thank you in advance for your support. Pretender Biden and the Demonic Democrats are proposing the greatest tax hike that we've seen in the history of our country. But this tax hike is far more than just giving up more of our income. It's actually a matter of giving up more of our liberty. More than 50 years ago, there was a man who warned us about this. I reintroduced him to you a few weeks ago. He was radio commentator Paul Harvey. I'm going to play for you as prophetic words of warning now. Then I'll be back to make a closing commentary. Now then, what makes a nation strong? Taxes? <laughs> There's nothing new about those either. The first income tax was paid by Abraham. It was written on a rock by the hand of divinity and handed to Moses at the top of Mount Sinai. And you might want to remember this. It was at the flat rate of 10%. It promised the wrath of God on anybody who tampered with or violated that law. Christ was born in Bethlehem because Joseph was on his way to pay his taxes. Joseph was a relatively well-to-do landowner of the house and lineage of David. Yet the taxes exacted by Caesar Augustus were so exorbitant that he didn't have enough money left over to employ a trusted messenger for the mission, so though his wife was great with child, he made the journey himself. And Christ was born in Bethlehem because Joseph was on his way to pay his taxes. And Christ was born in a manger because there was a housing shortage when he got there. Our problems are not new. At Runnymede, the Magna Carta was handed to King John on the end of a sword, denying to royalty the right of unlimited taxation. Yet you know it was for us, the American people, to become the first in recorded history ever voluntarily to surrender our rights to private property. Oh, yes, we did. With an innocent-sounding constitutional amendment, the 16th, which says that Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived, and we forgot to put any limit on the extent to which we could tax ourselves. Conceivably, we could be taxed out of all private property. We could be taxed not 70%, 80%, 90%, but 100%. We could awaken one morning and find that the government owns the farm and the house and the car and has a mortgage on the church, legally. Historically, whenever any nation has taxed its people more than 25% of their national income, initiative was destroyed, and that nation was headed for economic eclipse. Presently, the American people are being taxed 33% of their total income. History says we'll roll forward on momentum for a little while, but we'd better get some more gas in the tank pretty quick. 
You see, ours is not the first by George good government to arise on the world stage. There have been several. Rome, Spain, and Greece, and China, and each enjoyed about 150 years at its zenith. That's just about our time in the New World. And then each decayed away. Not one of them was ever destroyed by anybody else's marching legions. Each rotted away, morally, socially, culturally, economically, simultaneously. You know, one of the most cruel paradoxes of history is this. Because each was a good government, it bore bountiful fruit. And when it bore bountiful fruit, the people got fat. And when they got fat, they got lazy. And when they got lazy, they began to want to absolve themselves of personal responsibility and turn over to government to do for them things which traditionally they had been doing for themselves. At first, there appears to be nothing wrong asking government to perform some extra service for you, but if you ask government for extra services, government, in order to perform its increasing function, has to get bigger, right? And as government gets bigger, in order to support its increasing size, it has to what? Tax the individual more, so the individual gets littler. And to collect the increased taxes requires more tax collectors, so the government gets bigger, and in order to pay the additional tax collectors, it has to tax the individual more, so the government gets bigger, and the individual gets littler. And the government gets bigger, and the individual gets littler, until the government is all-powerful. The individual is hardly anything at all. The government is all-powerful. The people are cattle. Now, some believe that the need is for a vigorous, strong man to arise on the scene to regulate and regiment the affairs of men. Yet history tells us there have been several such. Once upon a time, there was a nation great and powerful and good. She was suffering from the aftermath of war, from a depression. And then came upon the scene a leader, an idealist, self-confident, intolerant of criticism. Wisely, he limited his early activities to combating the financial depression. Nobody could argue with that. But in a while, he began to regulate business and establish new rules to govern commerce and finance. Some of them in diametrical disagreement with the God-made laws of supply and demand, but anybody who disagreed with those new rules was promptly fired. The new leader saw that under the old system of free enterprise, landlords prospered, so he levied new taxes to take away their profits and destroy what he called the monopoly of capital. To please laborers, he controlled prices. To win the favor of the farmers... He gave them loans and subsidies. The national debt mounted alarmingly. Whenever anybody tried to tell him that governments, even as people, can go broke when they spend beyond their incomes, he said they just didn't understand deficit finance. Well, what do you say? Did he build on rock or on sand? I say on sand. For you see, this was the story of Emperor Tsu Tung Po, who led China to its doom more than a thousand years ago. I am satisfied with all my heart that if Uncle Sam ever does get whipped, here too, it will have been an inside job. It was internal decay, it was not external attack that destroyed the Roman Empire. Starting about 146 B.C., internal conditions in Rome were characterized by a welter of class wars and conflicts, street brawls, corrupt governors, lack of personal integrity and moral responsibility. About 290 years after Christ, a Roman emperor named Diocletian took over. He really grabbed the bull by the horns. He took over in a period of turmoil and severe depression. The first thing Diocletian did was call in the gold and close the banks and raise the taxes. He reduced the power of the Senate, delegated its power to a lot of little government bureaus. Do you know they even had a Transportation Act back there prescribing the fee required to rent one laden ass per mile? And at today's rate of exchange, it would have amounted to about one-eighth cent per mile, which meant that in order to make a profit, a jackass would have to carry five passengers? That was simply beyond the capacity of the jackass. Diocletian put millions of people on the public payroll, but when this failed to do the job, the country was still in trouble. He asked more personal powers for himself. For a brief while, incidentally, they were standby powers, but then he used them all at once. He froze wages, he froze prices, he froze jobs, he stopped profits, he dictated to the farmer what he should plant, when and how he should sell it, and for how much, and he rationed food. And what happened? The labor market closed down. Incentive was gone. Farm life became dependent on bureaucratic red tape. Exorbitant taxes cost the farmer his land. 
He kept for himself only a small plot on which he might grow turnips for his family. He lost the rest of it to the state, and without food and with incentive gone, city life stagnated and declined. And Rome passed into what history has recorded as the Dark Ages, lasting a thousand years. Just by turning to the left, the world has gone in circles. A nation would evolve from a monarchy into an oligarchy, from oligarchy to dictatorship, from dictatorship to bureaucracy, from bureaucracy to pure democracy, where finally the people would cry out from the chaos and confusion of the streets, Oh, please, God, give us a king, and God would give them a king. And they'd have a monarchy again and start the whole silly cycle anew. Now either we will profit from the errors of their ways, or it follows as the night the day, our children are going to have to relive the dark ages all over again. How come, after thousands of years of experiment, our new nation has come so far so fast? All this in less than 200 years. What is the secret of our success? Well, I think it had to do with a basic American's creed. Perhaps it never passed the pioneer's lips in this form, but if it had, I think he would have said something like this. I believe in my God, in my country, and in myself. I know that sounds like a trite, too simple thing to say, and yet it's a rare man today who will dare to stand up and say, I believe in my God and my country and in myself, and in that order. When the early American pioneer first turned his eyes toward the West, there were only Indian trails or traces, as they were called, for him to follow through the wilderness. Do you know today you can roller skate from Miami to Seattle, from San Diego to Plymouth Rock? In this little bitty instant, as historical time is measured, our 7% of the Earth's population has come to possess more than half of all the world's good things. How come? Well, sir, when that early pioneer turned his eyes toward the West, he didn't demand that somebody else look after him. He didn't demand a free education. He didn't demand a guaranteed rocking chair at eventide. He didn't demand that somebody else take care of him if he got ill or got old. There was an old-fashioned philosophy in those days that a man was supposed to provide for his own and for his own future. He didn't demand a maximum amount of money for a minimum amount of work. Nor did he expect pay for no work at all. Come to think of it, he didn't demand anything. That hard-handed pioneer just looked out there at the rolling plains, stretching away to the tall green mountains, and then lifted his eyes to the blue skies and said, Thank you, God. Now I can take it from here. Now that spirit isn't dead in our country. It's dormant. It's been discredited in some circles, driven underground, but it isn't dead. It's just that a few seasons ago, politicians baiting their hooks with free barbecue and trading a Ponzi promise for votes, began telling us we don't want opportunity anymore, we want security. We don't want opportunity, they said, we want security. They said it so often we came to believe them, we wanted security. And they gave us chains, and we were secure. Suddenly, with our constitutional guarantees depleted, with our national character eroding away, with our tax laws penalizing those who dare to prosper, with workers concentrating on how little they can get by with instead of how much they can produce, suddenly we looked overhead one day to discover that the first tin moon in space was a Russian accomplishment, that free men dragging their feet had been outdistanced by slave workers dragging their chains, and we were sore afraid. Perhaps this was a disguised blessing, too. Maybe a dramatic accomplishment by this Cold War adversary was necessary to get us off our dead centers and back to work again. If we can revive in ourselves, then in our youth, something of that basic American's creed, the horizon has never, ever been so limitless. For man stands now on the threshold of his highest adventure of all, his first faltering footsteps into space. Twenty years from today, half of the products you will be using in your Every day living aren't even in the dictionary yet. We've got it made. If we just keep on keeping on, we've got it made. And if we don't, we will follow those other great nation states of history into the graveyard of ignominious oblivion. History promises only this for certain. We will get exactly what we deserve. 
What Paul Harvey had to say was frightening to me, mainly because everything he warned us about then is visibly coming to pass as we meet and talk on this amazing platform, a technological advancement spawned by the very capitalism that the demonic Democrats are trying to destroy today. However, he also gives us hope. Paul Harvey talked about believing in our God, our country, and ourselves. You believe in God or you wouldn't be listening to this podcast. You believe in our country or you wouldn't be listening to this podcast. What I wonder about is whether you believe in yourselves. According to the analytics for this show, 61% of you are Catholic men between the ages of 18 and 34, so I'm especially speaking to you in this episode. An unfortunate reality among most 34-year-old men today is that they're less mature than the 18-year-olds of America when we entered World War II in 1941. This is so because modern men have never had to suffer nor sacrifice for anything greater than themselves. They don't even know the definition of self-reliance because there's always been a safety net available from their parents or, more likely, the government. You've heard what Paul Harvey had to say about that. One of the life-altering benefits of joining the Army was that it made me a man. I learned what sacrifice and hardship are. I learned what it was to successfully complete a vital mission for something greater than myself. But I didn't have a complete understanding of the importance of sacrifice, hardship, and living by principle until after I became a Catholic. Looking back, I now realize that I didn't really have any principles at all then. Sure, I gave lip service to principle, but until the church taught me what it was to stand on principle and to sacrifice for those principles, I realized that for the first 30 years of my life, I didn't really have any principles. I'll give you an example of what it is to stand on principle. Do you know what I did with the stimulus money we got under both the Trump and Biden administrations? I sent them back. Someone said, that's crazy. That was your money intended for you. No, it wasn't. I don't pay taxes, so how is it mine? Oh, the government takes taxes from me throughout the year, but my income is so meager that the government sends it all back to me at the end of the year. No, those stimulus checks were nothing more than a socialistic redistribution of wealth. In my situation, those who actually do pay taxes were forced by the government to give me their money. I stand on the principle that socialism is evil, and our government is acting with evil when it does socialistic acts. These stimulus checks gave me the opportunity to do more than pay lip service to my principles. That's why I sent the money back. Did Mrs. Sixpack and I need the money? Sure, we needed it as badly as anyone else. But to accept that money was first and foremost a cooperation with government in its evil theft from the people who actually pay taxes, and it would have been my participation in the evil of socialism. That's an example of what I mean about standing on your principles. But what about self-reliance? My first sense of reliance isn't on myself. My first sense of reliance is on Almighty God. Since he cares about even every bird that falls to the ground and the numbers of hairs in my head, I have to know and believe that he cares about every little thing that happens in mine and Mrs. Sixpack's life. But oddly enough, that naturally leads to belief in myself, my own self-reliance. God gave me a brain with the ability to use reason and logic. He gave all of us that. Some of my other natural abilities he allowed to be taken from me through a debilitating stroke, and I can see now how that worked to his greater glory. My acceptance of what I lost has been rewarded by him by gaining so much more. We have friends we never knew we had. Although we live far below the poverty level, God has seen to it that we get exactly what we need, exactly when we need it. He's also given me this great six-pack family of listeners and readers. He's given me the opportunity to share with and love 37,000 souls I wouldn't have otherwise had the opportunity to get to know. 
regarding self-reliance because I still have a fully functioning brain, although some might disagree with that. I can still write and create for his greater glory and your greater good. Like some of my friends in the podcasting business, I could easily turn this into a money-making venture with a full-time living. I don't because of an agreement I made with Raymond Leo Cardinal Burke and because souls mean more to me than the comforts money can provide. This is the point. I'm confident in my ability to be self-reliant despite my disabilities. You can be too. You don't need to rely on anyone or anything else save God. God gave you two feet so you can stand upright on your own. You don't need to or should rely on anyone else. Be a man and stand up on your own two feet. No matter what your life circumstances are, you can rise above them. Even if they're already high, you can go even higher. As long as you trust in God, believe in the greatness of our country, and believe in your own God-given abilities, you can achieve anything. But you've got to be strong enough, to be man enough, to stand on your principles, to be willing to die for your principles. I'm going to close this segment by repeating something I said to you in a previous episode not long ago. It's the Possibility Thinker's Creed. When faced with a mountain, I will not quit. I will keep on striving until I find a pass through, go around, tunnel underneath, or simply stay and turn the mountain into a gold mine with God's help. Believe in your God. Believe in your country. Believe in yourself and show it through believing in this creed. God love you. Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, wants to make sure you're informed about all the Catholic news you need to know. Here's Joe Sixpack's top five Catholic news picks for this episode. Catholic news pick number five. Hats off to Catholic News Agency. The Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld Ohio's pro-life ban on abortions based on a Down syndrome diagnosis. The right to an abortion before viability is not absolute, wrote Judge Alice Batchelder in the court's majority opinion, adding, Simply put, there's no absolute or per se right to an abortion based on the stage of pregnancy. yee You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic, Catholic News Pick Number 4 Hats off to the Daily Wire. A CNN director admitted that the network actively worked to get President Trump out of office, even creating propaganda on issues that they knew little about to further their goal. In a secretly recorded conversation, CNN technical director Charlie Chester said, Look, what we did, we got Trump out. I am 100% going to say it, and I 100% believe that if it wasn't for CNN, I don't know that Trump would have got voted out. I came to CNN because I wanted to be a part of that. Why, you no good, stinking, rotten rascal! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News News Pick pick number three. three. Hats off to the Catholic vote. A group of three senators introduced legislation that would revoke Major League Baseball's exemption under antitrust law. The legislative push comes after BLM pulled its all-star game from Georgia in protest against the state's recently passed election integrity bill. We're here today to talk about legislation to remove the antitrust exemption that's long been enjoyed by the Major League Baseball, Senator Mike Lee said at a press conference. It's important to remember that this exemption was created from whole cloth by the Supreme Court 99 years ago. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News News Pick pick number two. two. Hats off to the Daily Wire. Executives from Ford, 
General Motors, and other Michigan-based corporations sent a warning shot across the bow of the state's GOP lawmakers as the legislature considers a bill against election fraud. Government must avoid actions that reduce participation in elections, read a statement signed by dozens of corporate executives, particularly among historically disenfranchised communities, persons with disabilities, older adults, racial minorities, and low-income voters. Ooh, that smells! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic, Catholic News Pick number one. Hats off to the Daily Signal. Here's a rundown of 16 states, from Alabama to Utah, that are considering legislation to prohibit doctors from performing transgender surgeries and procedures on minors. Oh, I love it! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. but I am fair. It's time for the Catholic Boot Camp with your drill sergeant, Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Learn the Catholic faith and how to defend it like you've never heard it before. This boot camp is tough, so there's no political correctness, no spirit of Vatican II, and no namby-pamby platitudes. Drill Sergeant Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, will prepare you for spiritual war. Now here's Joe Sixpack. A frugal farmer was on his way to market one day when he saw a piece of string lying on the road. He thought it might come in useful, so he bent down to pick it up, just as a passerby saw him put it into his pocket. Later, a man's wallet containing several hundred dollars was reported lost in the same spot, so the police asked the farmer what he knew about it. They didn't believe him when he told them that he'd only picked up a piece of string. Indeed, the entire town laughed at the farmer's explanation. He tried to tell everyone around town the true story of what happened, but nobody believed him. He couldn't sleep that night and was absolutely miserable over everyone thinking he was a thief. The next day, the wallet was found lying empty on the road. The farmer happily told everyone this new detail, but by now he'd been judged guilty by common consent of the townspeople. They decided this latest development was just a clever trick by the farmer so he could keep the money. His reputation ruined, the farmer returned home. He brooded over the incident until it drove him to a nervous breakdown and mental illness. He kept babbling over and over to himself, a piece of string. It was only a piece of string. He died soon after that. As we complete our examination of the Eighth Commandment, this story touches on so much of what we've already learned. It covers some of what we'll look at today. Calumny, contumely, libel, secrets, and reparation for sins against this commandment. Calumny is probably a new word for some of you. Calumny, which we commonly call slander today, is the making of remarks contrary to the truth which harm the reputation of others and give occasion of false judgment concerning them. Calumny is gravely immoral because everyone has a right to a good reputation. If calumny was a new word for some of you, I suspect contumely is a new word for most of you. I know I didn't know either word when I first started studying Catholicism, but they really are words that were at one time common in our language. Anyway, contumely is showing contempt for a person by unjustly dishonoring him. It may be committed by ignoring the person, refusing to show him the proper signs of respect, or through ridicule. Not only is this a sin against the Eighth Commandment, but it tempts the person being disrespected to anger, revenge, and other sins. Libel is any false or malicious written or printed statement or any sign, picture, or effigy tending to injure the person's reputation in any way. We commonly see this today when a political cartoonist abuses his liberty in favor of license to harm a political enemy. I'm not saying all political cartoons are libelous. I'm merely saying that they often go too far. We also see violations of the Eighth Commandment regarding secrets. 
We're obliged to keep secrets if we promise to do so, or if our office requires it, such as lawyers, doctors, or priests, or if the good of others demands it. Covered under this prohibition against revealing secrets extends to reading the private letters and writings of others. We may never read such letters or the private writings of others, such as diaries, without the person's permission, unless the motive for reading them is to prevent grave harm to oneself, another, or society. For example, say your friend has been very depressed lately and you're concerned about him. You can't find your friend one day, but do find a letter he's written left on his desk. Should you look at the letter? If you're concerned it could be a suicide note, then you can look at it. If, however, it becomes apparent that the letter isn't a suicide note, then you're morally obligated to stop reading it and to keep to yourself the content of that part of the letter that you've already read. This indirectly leads us to the seal of confession. The vast majority of people believe the seal of confession applies only to priests. That simply isn't the case. According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the secret of the sacrament of reconciliation is sacred and cannot be violated under any pretext. Therefore, if you somehow gain knowledge of matter for someone's confession, you must never reveal that knowledge to anyone. This extends to seeing or becoming privy to someone's sin that hasn't yet been confessed because it's a potential matter for confession, whether the person confesses it or not. The only exception to that is in the case of a felonious act. But even if you come to know of a felonious act because you may have overheard a sacramental confession, you're obligated to keep that information to yourself. It's gravely immoral to violate the seal of confession, even if you merely overheard a confession. I know I've overheard several confessions while waiting to see the priest myself because the person ahead of me speaks too loudly. What I've overheard will die with me, as it should you. Reparations for sins against the Eighth Commandment are absolutely necessary, and making reparation one time will keep you from ever committing that particular sin again. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says, For every offense committed against justice and truth entails the duty of reparation, even if its author has been forgiven. When it is impossible publicly to make reparation for a wrong, it must be made secretly. If someone who has suffered harm cannot be directly compensated, he must be given moral satisfaction in the name of charity. The duty of reparation also concerns offenses against another's reputation. The reparation, moral and sometimes material, must be evaluated in terms of the extent of the damage inflicted. It obliges in conscience. Here's an example of reparation. Let's say Deacon John owns a plumbing business and you see his truck outside a known brothel at 2 o'clock in the morning. Your first obligation is to view the situation in the best possible light, that he's probably there on an emergency call to fix a busted water pipe. But rather than doing as you ought, you instead tell other people you saw his truck outside the brothel. Later, when you discover he was indeed repairing a busted pipe, you have to make reparation for telling others what you saw. How's that done? You have to go to everyone you told and correct what you told them. You must also find out who they told and go to those people as well. You must also find out who they told and go to them as well. You have to carry this reparation as far as is possible in the name of justice and charity. So you can see it's much easier to learn to tame the tongue rather than let it move freely. I think St. James gives us the best advice in his epistle. Wherefore, it is better to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. In other words, you have two ears and one mouth, so use them proportionately. The Catholic Church is 2,000 years old. A lot of wisdom is gained over two millennia. Each week we'll share some of that wisdom with a Catholic quote. So here's this week's Catholic quote. This week's Catholic quote is from St. John Chrysostom. He said, How many of you say, I should like to see his face? 
his garments, his shoes. You do see him. You touch him. You eat him. He gives himself to you, not only that you may see him, but also to be your food and nourishment. I believe a really great way to teach the faith is through stories, parables, and anecdotes. So here's today's story. Last week, I told you about a convict convert I met in my work in prison apostolate. That story reminded me of another man whose life demonstrated how infinite God's graces are. Let's just call him Carl. I knew who Carl was long before I met him. Even though I wasn't a priest or a deacon, I earned the trust of the warden of the prison so much that from time to time I was allowed to have free run of the prison in order to share with the men. That was how I learned about Carl. Everyone in the prison knew who Carl was because he was legendary in the penal system. He was known throughout the system as a cold-blooded killer who knew how to get anything other prisoners wanted, for money, of course. Everything from drugs to free world liquor and to even to women on occasion. You could tell by looking into his eyes that he'd rather kill you than talk to you, and the other men I worked with in our apostolate were afraid of him. I even saw really tough guys move out of his way when he walked down the hall, calling him sir while nodding their head to respectfully acknowledge him. You see, Carl started out on death row in 1970, but his sentence was commuted to life when the Supreme Court outlawed the death penalty in 1972. Carl hated religion and anyone having anything to do with it. He considered them weak. I began praying that God would allow me an opportunity to speak to Carl. How tough was Carl? After I finally met him and earned his trust, he showed me a Silver Star citation from when he was a Marine in Vietnam. The citation didn't tell the whole story, so Carl filled in the blanks for me. It seems that Carl had been ordered to guard the base camp ammo supply one night. Before reporting to his post, he went to his tent to get a bottle of whiskey he had stashed away. While at his guard post, Carl got drunk and fell asleep. Well, it just so happened that two Viet Cong managed to creep into the camp undetected with the intention of taking the munitions from the supply Carl was supposed to be guarding. They decided to kill the drunk sleeping Marine before taking the munitions. Things get a little hazy at this point. According to the citation, when the Viet Cong attempted to kill Carl, they used a bayonet to slice about two feet across his abdomen and very deep. The citation said that while Carl held in his intestines with one hand, he killed the two enemy with the other hand. Carl was a bad hombre. The prison we were working in used to allow the prisoners to get a package every year from home for Christmas. Many men never got packages because their families couldn't afford it or they simply had no families. Recognizing the need, we used that as an evangelistic tool. We put out the word that we'd provide a Christmas package to any convict who would attend weekly catechism classes and mass beginning in August. No strings except those. The hope and prayer was that weekly exposure to Catholic truth and mass would reach inside the souls of these men. It worked very well. A lot of converts were made. Carl came to me and said, I hear you'll give a package to anyone attending your stuff. I ain't never had a package before and I want one. Can I get one? I told Carl he could, as long as he attended catechism and mass until the beginning of December. He replied, Okay, but I don't want no one trying to make me no Catholic. I promised him no one would ever say a word. Carl was as good as his word. He sat quietly in the back of the room at the catechism classes. He did the same at Mass. Then, after the last required catechism class in December, Carl approached me. I thought he was wanting to verify that he was getting his promised package, but instead he said, I want to be a Catholic. Carl became a Catholic, all right, and he brought as many other convicts into the church as he could after that. Grace had transformed this man of immense evil into a devout Catholic. About a decade later, Carl died a happy death from liver cancer. 
I arranged to have this devout brother buried with military honors in a Catholic cemetery. Carl is the reason I'm opposed to the death penalty in most cases. Pat Buchanan and I debated this for a long time. His belief was that a man on death row had plenty of time to get his affairs right with God before being put to death. I never could convince Buchanan that it doesn't work that way, that conversion isn't possible until God offers those graces, and he does so on his own time. Carl was an example of that. Had he not been moved from death row in 1972, chances are he'd have never converted. God didn't send Carl conversion graces until 25 years later. Most people I've known and talked to believe that a hardened criminal can't change. That's really a form of blasphemy, because it implies that God can't give them the graces for change. Carl is an example of that, so keep Carl's story in mind the next time you're about to write someone off as hopeless. This has been The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Thanks for subscribing, and be sure to visit cantankerouscatholic.com to get your free copy of Joe's popular book, The Best of What We Believe, Why We Believe It. 